Police emergency. Hey, uh, I want the cotton bottles missing, please. Right, how old is she? Nine. Nine? Yeah. When did you last see her? She went to school this morning. Right, have there been any arguments or anything? No, like not that? at all. No. Have, have you been in touch with any of her friends or anybody like that? I've been everywhere I can think of her right. friends, wives, and family and everything. And nobody at all? No. Any information or where she can be? No. Does she go to school and come back on her own? normally then? Yes. Right, so you were expecting her home off at 4 o'clock? About, about half a seat later she's come right. back and trust me, she's at 3. Does she have a mobile phone or anything like that? No, she's at home. Just, right, so she, there's no way of actually ringing to yeah. find out. But you've rung around all the friends yeah. and you've been in touch with all the relatives yeah. and there's nowhere else that you've got left to look. No. Have you been in touch with the school? Or, 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 can they confirm whether she went to at normal time at 10 past me? <laughs> Right. What the caller? Shannon Matthews. Has she been missing before? No, first time. And there's been nothing to, to, to intimate why she should go? No, no. On the 19th of February 2008, at Dewsbury's Moorside Estate, West Yorkshire, Karen Matthews made a 999 call to report her daughter, nine-year-old Shannon Matthews, missing. Shannon was supposed to have arrived home at 3.30pm after finishing up swimming lessons with her school. However, she failed to show up. She was last seen leaving the swimming centre at the end of the day at 3.10pm. As you heard, Shannon's mother Karen made the 999 call to report her daughter missing at 6.48pm that evening after confirming to the operator that she was not at any known friend's or family member's address. Detective Superintendent Andy Brennan was given the task of investigating Shannon's disappearance, and by the next day, police stated that their search team had increased to over 200 officers, as concerns over Shannon's safety grew. News around the local community spread quickly. Friends, neighbours, family, and even strangers joined the police with the search. At least another 200 people were thought to have joined police with helping find Shannon. In the meantime, Shannon was assigned the family liaison officer, Christine Freeman, to help support the family during this distressing time. On the 22nd of February, police released the CCTV footage of Shannon leaving Dewsbury Sports Centre on the day of her disappearance. It was now four days since Shannon vanished. Police had one possible sighting of her the previous day which they were taking seriously but they had nothing else to work on in terms of how she went missing. Police searched Shannon's room and found a note scribbled on the wall, saying that she wanted to live with her father. Upon finding this, police believed that Shannon could have possibly run away. They discovered one of her half-brothers had run away twice, but Karen was adamant that Shannon would never have done this, although police wouldn't entirely rule this theory out. The home was also in poor condition. There was a smell of cigarettes and marijuana, as well as many takeaway boxes left in the kitchen. There were also unwashed clothes left lying around in the home. This raised some doubts over the stability of the family home. Christine Freeman noted that when she first arrived at the Matthews home, Craig Meehan, Shannon's stepfather, was playing Xbox with Karen sat next to him, barely acknowledging her assigned FLO. This was unusual behaviour for someone whose child had gone missing. She also spoke of one time where her phone rang, playing a pop song she assigned as her ringtone. As she was trying to answer her phone to silence the embarrassing jingle, Karen got up and began dancing to the tune. Again, Christine found this behaviour very odd. By this time, the media attention surrounding Shannon's disappearance had grown considerably. Her face was appearing on the front pages, and as news spread, Karen wanted to give a public appeal in the hope that it would help find her daughter. The police and Karen's FLO disagreed, saying that if Shannon had been kidnapped, appealing to the public this early may put Shannon's life at risk. Despite their protests, Karen went ahead with the appeal. 24 hours after she went missing, the search for Shannon Matthews goes on. Right, can you just come in so they can tell you where to search? Family, friends and neighbours trawling the streets for any sign of the nine-year-old. Tonight, with the worry etched on her face, Shannon's mother appealed for her daughter's return. 
Shannon, if you're out there, please, darling, come home. We love you so much. Me and your dad, your brothers, your sisters, everybody loves you. Your dad's missing you so much, Shannon. He's even out looking for you. Please come home, Shannon. If you're out there, come home. If anybody's got my daughter, my beautiful princess daughter, please bring her home safe. Police brought in a team of behavioural experts, a dedicated team of scientists, mountain rescue teams, and recruited 16 of the 27 specialist victim recovery dogs in the whole of the United Kingdom. On the 28th of February, police had visited 3,000 homes, spoke to 1,500 motorists, and had received over 500 calls regarding Shannon. Volunteers were also visiting supermarkets, handing out leaflets and posters looking for the lost girl. Julie Bushby, a friend of Karen, would lead the volunteer search and campaign for the safe return of Shannon. They had converted the local community centre on the Moorside estate to a hub, where they would organise searches, as well as create shirts, leaflets and posters to distribute across the area. As temperatures continued to fall and the nights grew colder, with no new information to go on, police feared that Shannon may have fallen into the wrong hands. On the 1st of March 2008, 11 days after Shannon disappeared, Karen launched another appeal for the safe return of Shannon on the eve of Mother's Day. On the 3rd of March, Karen issues another appeal, this time requesting that anyone who may be holding Shannon captive to let her go. She alludes that she may know the person who has taken her daughter captive and that the family no longer feels safe. The following day, Police had now obtained a full DNA profile of Shannon to use in places where she may have been since she was last seen. At this point, police were now dedicating 10% of its operational strength to finding Shannon. This involved 250 officers and 60 detectives. This had become the biggest operation for West Yorkshire police since hunting for the Yorkshire Ripper. It was estimated that the search cost £3.2 million. Despite trying to keep the focus on finding Shannon, with no new information, media interest began to decline. The Sun newspaper offered a £20,000 reward for information leading to the location of Shannon Matthews, although they would increase this to £50,000 later. A local business in Huddersfield would also offer a £5,000 reward to the safe return of Shannon. The Help Find Shannon Matthews Fund was launched by the police to help raise funds in the search for Shannon as well. Shannon Matthews disappeared nine months after Madeleine McCann. The police were under intense pressure to ensure that they were doing everything right, to avoid the criticisms Portuguese police experienced when Madeleine vanished. As overall media attention waned, the focus began to shift less on Shannon Matthews and more towards the actual family. News articles were written about Karen and Craig. Craig was accused of abusing the children, even by Karen's own mother. Karen's mother alleged that while she had never witnessed Craig hit the children, they would tell her that he had. Questions were also raised by the media, suggesting that Shannon had indeed run away, or that Craig was possibly involved with Shannon's disappearance. Karen and Craig would fiercely deny any accusations made towards them. Karen would also defend Craig on ITV's morning show, GMTV, saying that she was certain that Craig was not involved with Shannon going missing. Shannon's biological father, Leon Rose, who had returned to the area after learning Shannon had gone missing to assist with the search, also defended Craig. The perception of the media in the Moorside estate area soured. They were questioning why the media would put out hit pieces against Karen and Craig, rather than focus their attention on finding Shannon. They would also wonder why the McCanns had not been scrutinised so intensely and suspected that it may be down to the fact that the McCanns were a wealthy, middle-class family with a respectable background, while Karen was an unemployed mother of seven children by five different fathers who was living in a poor, working-class area. The criticism on the media by the local community was also echoed by other media outlets, including the independent and left-wing political activist and Guardian opinion writer Owen Jones. Despite this, the local community, Julie Bushby in particular, would continue to campaign and both Karen and Craig would use the media, including inviting a documentary crew into the family home to document the goings-on within the Matthews household. However, 
24 days after Shannon's disappearance, the attention would sharply swing back towards the direction of the missing nine-year-old girl. Earlier on, during the investigation, police had drawn up a family tree of the Matthews family. As you can imagine, this was a huge tree, with many spanning branches, unlike anything police had dealt with previously. As they reviewed the tree, looking to speak to family members so they could rule them out of their investigation, they discovered that one name was missing from the tree, Michael Donovan. Initially, police didn't think too much of this, as it was possible Karen and Michael forgot to include him in the family tree. After all, when police first spoke to Karen, she had mistakenly said she only had six children, when this was not the case. Police had challenged her on this, and she brushed it off as an honest mistake, albeit a strange one to make. What was odd, was that Donovan was not involved in any way with helping with the search for Shannon Matthews. He also didn't come forward to police to confirm his relationship with the family. Karen and Craig had also never mentioned Michael, despite him living in such close proximity to the pair. So on the 14th of March 2008, two officers went to visit Michael Donovan to collect DNA samples and to speak with him. However, there was no answer. Instead, the officers then spoke with Donovan's neighbours, who said that he was likely to be home as his car was still parked outside and it was rare for him to leave the home unless he was driving somewhere. Another neighbour, who lived below the flat Donovan lived in, told the officers that she had heard shuffling around in the flat above, but assumed that it was the child of Donovan's new girlfriend. Alarm bells were now ringing. The officers were certain that something wrong was going on. They immediately decided to radio for backup. Once backup had arrived, police discussed the best course of action. This wasn't a lengthy conversation, as they decided they needed to break into the flat to search the property, as it was best to be wrong and not find Shannon there, than to be overly cautious and give Donovan the chance to move Shannon elsewhere. Upon forcing entry, they were disappointed. The house was empty. It appeared that the shuffling sounds were indeed from another child, and that Donovan wasn't at home and had opted not to take his car for a change. However, there was the thick smell of cigarette smoke, as if someone had smoked recently in the flat. This prompted police to search deeper. They reached the locked bedroom door and forced entry inside, where they immediately heard the muffling sounds of a child coming from under the bed. Before the police had a chance to react, one of the sliding drawers of the divan bed slid open, where Shannon weakly popped out of the solid bed frame. Shannon was dazed and unable to stand properly, but she was alive. Police scooped her up and carried her out of the flat. The officer carrying her asked where Donovan was, to which she replied, where I was, under the bed. Michael Donovan was found soon after in the same compartment of the divan bed as Shannon and was arrested immediately for the kidnap, struggling with officers as they dragged him out of his flat. Shannon was taken back to Dewsbury Police Station, where she was checked over by the medical staff there. Police then got to work checking over Donovan's flat, looking to find out what conditions Shannon was being kept under during her ordeal. While searching the residence, they found evidence that showed Shannon had been tied by her waist by a sturdy fabric material which extended to the roof beams, which meant Shannon was unable to move freely around the flat, or even escaping, when Michael needed to leave. There was also a list of instructions found in the room Shannon was kept in. These rules were, you must not make any noise or bang your feet. You must not go near the windows. You must not get anything or do anything without me being here. Keep the TV volume low, only up to eight or lower. You can play Super Mario games and you can play some DVDs and you can play the CD music. I P U, meaning I promise you. What the exact meaning of this was, police were unclear of. Police also found cash totaling £600, as well as travel sickness medication and two bags of children's clothes, folded neatly. Police believe that Donovan may have been planning to leave the flat with Shannon and run away. Fortunately though, he never got the chance, likely due to the media attention surrounding Shannon's disappearance and the fact her face was recognised nationwide now. The search was now over, Shannon was found alive, she was safe, a kidnapper in police custody. There were jubilant scenes all over the Dewsbury Moorside estate, with relieved friends and family members, neighbours, and even police, 
who had helped with the search, joining in the party atmosphere. Meanwhile, in custody, Michael Donovan would reveal to police that the case itself wasn't as open and shut as it would appear. In fact, there was still a piece of the puzzle missing. Michael Donovan didn't act alone. There was one person out there on the estate, alongside those celebrating the discovery of Shannon. It was Karen Matthews. Early on into the investigation, Christine Freeman, the family liaison officer assigned to Karen, suspected that something was wrong early on. Besides dancing to ringtones, there were many other instances which drew suspicion to Karen. One evening, while media were reporting live outside Karen's home, the family were opening and shutting their curtains to see how long the delay was. When they saw their curtain flicker on the TV, Karen cheered. Another time when Karen saw Shannon's picture appear on the news, instead of behaving like a mother whose main concern was bringing her daughter home, she turned to friends and said to them, Look, Shannon's famous now. Friends had also grown concerned over Karen's seemingly odd behaviour. People would comment on how Karen would appear upset and concerned when on TV, but as soon as the cameras were not there, she would instantly switch, laughing with her friends and not appearing at all concerned. There was also another occasion where she visited her local chip shop. When the owner expressed his sympathies to her and offered her free food, she commented that perhaps more of her kids should go missing. One of Karen's close friends, Natalie, would also say that when Karen visited her, she would appear to act like her normal, happy self. She would also outright reject the possibility that Shannon was dead, firmly asserting that she would eventually return home. A teddy bear she held during public appeals didn't even belong to Shannon. While the streets were celebrating Shannon being found, Karen appeared nonchalant, distant, frightened. In front of the media, while posing for the cameras with Craig, one of her friends shouted to her to smile for the cameras. Furthermore, when police told Karen that she couldn't see Shannon face to face because it could potentially contaminate evidence as well as disrupt their investigation, Karen didn't seem phased. She just agreed. However, she was able to see her daughter through a two-way mirror. Now you'd think after not seeing your daughter for 24 days, Karen would be desperate to find out how she was. Although upon seeing Shannon, all she could say was, oh, she's got new clothes. Karen rarely, if ever, was seen asking how Shannon was and didn't seem worried for her daughter at all. Concerned for Shannon's well-being, she was placed under police protection and cared for by the local social services department. After she was released from police protection, she was transferred to Kirkley's Family Services, where she would continue to be cared for there. While all this seemed odd to most, the pieces didn't really start falling into place until Shannon was found and Donovan was questioned by police. Upon speaking to Donovan, he was demanding police speak to Karen, as he told them that Shannon's disappearance was planned by both, in order to collect the reward money being offered during the search for Shannon. He said that he and Karen discussed the plan at a cafe, where Karen laid out how it would work. He would hold Shannon captive initially, until reward money was offered where he would release her away from CCTV and find her, thus being the hero of the story. Donovan claimed that initially he refused to participate in the plot, but Karen had threatened that if he didn't, she would send three men to his flat and beat him up. It was then that he reluctantly agreed. Karen was brought in under caution for interrogation. Naturally, she denied any involvement with Shannon's disappearance and refuted the claims made by Donovan. A speculation over Karen's involvement grew around the local community. Out of the blue, Craig Meehan was arrested on the 2nd of April 2008, after computers the police had seized from the home contained indecent images of children. On the 6th of April, neighbour Natalie Murray, who early on suspected Karen, as well as Julie Bushby and FLO Christine Freeman, arranged to meet Karen in Christine's car, hoping to find the truth once and for all. Karen, in the front seat of the car, making no eye contact with the other women, looked dejected. Natalie immediately began saying, Look Karen, I'm not going to beat around a bush. There's a lot of stuff I've seen you do and say. None of it adds up to me. You know, I know, there's something going on. 
Karen Matthews gave a huge sigh, her shoulders dropped, and admitted her deception by saying, Yeah, it's true. She then began to break down into tears, perhaps the first sign of real emotion that any of the women had seen since Shannon had disappeared. People will hate me for what I've done. I've disgraced the kids. Karen wept. She was arrested that day, and on the 8th of April 2008, Karen Matthews was charged with child neglect and perverting the course of justice. It was reported that the McCann fund managers were contacted by members of the Matthews family, demanding money from them to assist with Shannon's search. The McCanns were prepared to send £25,000 to them, but were advised against this by police once they had begun investigating Karen Matthews. Prior to the court hearings, police had to issue a letter campaign to neighbours, pleading with them not to seek vigilante justice. On the 16th of September, Craig Meehan was found guilty for possession of indecent images of children and sentenced to 20 weeks in prison. However, because of the time he spent on remand, he had already served his time and was freed. Karen and Michael Donovan's trial began on the 12th of November 2008, where we learned that Shannon had been drugged for up to 20 months prior to her kidnapping. Karen had also denied any involvement with the kidnapping and denied that there was a plan to benefit from the reward money being offered. But on the 23rd of January 2009, Karen Matthews and Michael Donovan were both found guilty and sentenced to eight years in prison. Karen and Donovan are now both free as of 2012, after serving just half of their prison terms. Shannon Matthews, as well as all her siblings, were taken into care and given new identities. There's a lifelong anonymity protection order for Shannon, so no details are available as to how Shannon is today, although it's believed she is doing well. On the 5th of December, Kirkley's counsel announced an independent serious case review into the dealings agencies had with the Matthews family, after reports Shannon was taken off the child protection register despite warnings from social workers. But on the 16th of June 2010, the review concluded that social services and other agencies couldn't be blamed, as they determined that Shannon's kidnapping was something that they wouldn't have been able to foresee. This was a huge case at the time which definitely affected many people. What was supposed to have had a happy ending turned out to be an ultimate betrayal by a mother to her daughter. There were rumours that Shannon was kidnapped as part of a plot for Karen to leave Craig but the situation got out of hand. However, the prevailing narrative was that this was actually for money. Not only was Shannon betrayed, but the community of the Moorside estate, who went to great lengths to help a mother in need, to help her be reunited with her daughter again, were understandably furious with Karen after the truth came to light. While the actions of Karen were despicable, the actions of the community over those 24 days should be praised. People like Julie Bushby, who went above and beyond to get Shannon's face out there, to keep her in the minds of people is totally commendable. What was seen during that time was a community rallied together to help one of their own. Who couldn't take inspiration from the actions of people like Julie Bushby? Karen Matthews is now dubbed Britain's worst mum, deservedly so. I just hope that Shannon and of course her brothers and sisters, who no doubt would have been rocked by the truth of this case, have found peace and are better now than they were then. Thank you for watching this video. Normally I wouldn't reveal my next case until it comes out, but news came out on the 13th of November 2020 that Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, had passed away. Given that this case was the largest investigation since the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper, I thought it would be worth covering his story in next week's video. So if you want to find out more about the man, what he did and how he was caught, Subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when that and future videos are released. Also, if you liked today's video, please hit the like button and share it with people that you know who are into true crime, as it really helps the channel, and I really appreciate it a lot. So yeah, thanks for watching. I'll be back next Sunday where we'll go over the Yorkshire Ripper case. But until then, take care, and goodbye. For now.